Hello. Today, I would like to share with you methods for sample preparation for a single cell proteomics and their application to explore the human cell division cycle. I would like to start with a brief motivation for performing single cell protein analysis. And one of the fundamental reasons for that is the fact that our bodies are made of functionally diverse cells that also have different molecular composition as illustrated here to the left with this tumor cell covered by four T cell lymphocytes. Similarly, as we differentiate stem cells in the laboratory, we generate highly heterogeneous mixtures of, of cells that ideally we should be able to analyze at the single cell level. And indeed, there has been a lot of progress made in that direction. Even when we look at a um, single cell type, as shown in the case of these epithelial cells, they differ depending on multiple factors, such as the cell division cycle. In this case, I'm showing a series of images where a handful of proteins have been labeled fluorescently. And as you can see, they change significantly depending on the cell division cycle phase. In fact, there are many other proteins that change with the cell division cycle, except that that remains poorly explored. It remains an open scientific question because of technological limitations in measuring the protein, the proteome dynamics during the cell division cycle. Uh, and that's a problem that can be addressed with uh, single cell proteomics, as I'm going to uh, show you towards the end of this presentation. Much of the single cell analysis performed today is based on measuring DNA uh, RNA abundances, which are very useful for a number of applications, but they remain insufficient for characterizing uh, the, the biology at the single cell level because protein abundances, such as for the tumor suppressor protein P53, are not always reflected in the messenger RNA abundances. And this is true uh, for a much larger set of proteins as our unbiased systematic analysis indicated, as shown to, to the right. And of course, there are many additional levels of biological regulation at the level of protein-protein interactions, post-translational modifications, and signaling dynamics that are even less reflected in the RNA abundances that we measure. So another exciting reason to measure protein abundances in single cells is the possibility to use protein protein co-variation to infer regulatory interactions between proteins, and particularly the exciting possibility of being able to condition the co-variation on various confounding factors and distinguish between direct and indirect regulatory interactions. For all these reasons, it would be wonderful to be able to analyze proteins in single cells at scale, and yet, we continue to face challenges as I summarized in this review here and categorized in, in three groups. There are challenges in delivering proteins to the mass spec for analysis. There are challenges in determining the sequence of peptides and proteins. And there are challenges in increasing the throughput so that we can analyze a large number of single cells. These challenges have been addressed by a number of synergistic solutions developed by the community that mutually reinforce each other, as shown with the honeycomb puzzle pattern at, at the bottom of, of this slide. Uh, the first and the third challenge are going to be the focus of my talk today, and in particular, how we can uh, increase the delivery of proteins and increase the throughput by improving sample preparation methods. There have been very interesting efforts and very productive efforts in the community to develop uh, sample preparation methods for single cell proteomics, in particular nanopods, which will be discussed in this session today. Uh, I will not uh, focus on this, rather I'll focus on discussing the methods that my group has developed. 
to begin with, uh, to give a historical perspective, I'll start with methods uh, using detergents and chaotropic agents that are able to efficiently lyse cells and extract proteins for the analysis. But oftentimes these chemicals are incompatible with mass spectrometers and therefore have to be removed. And this removal process can also result in protein losses, which could be prohibitive for very small samples, such as single cells. Because of that, uh, the strategy in my group has always been to use mass spec compatible reagents. We wanted to avoid any chemical that would be mass spec incompatible and potentially would have to be removed. And the first method that we used was, was based on lysing single cells by focused acoustic sonication in pure water. We were able to do that in about 10 microliters per single cell. And this method was fairly laborious and low throughput. So it was clear to us that we have to develop methods that are uh, more efficient, easier to automate and higher throughput. Uh, and in this process, as you can see here uh, with our second and third generation methods, we have been able to reduce the volumes of sample preparation by orders of magnitude. Harrison Specht, a PhD student in my group, led the, the first effort in developing an automated relatively high throughput method. And Harrison tried a lot of different methods, some of which worked beautifully in lysing single cells, such as a freeze thaw cycle, but they weren't efficient in extracting the proteins for mass spec analysis. And then he found that the freeze heat cycle, which we call MPOP in, in a multi-well plate, works quite well. So why do we think that it works? Because Harrison Specht did a well control experiment. And in particular, he used cells that were either labeled with light or heavy isotopes, and they were lysed with either standard six more urea or with MPOP and then analyzed by mass spectrometry to compare the efficiency of protein extraction. And Harrison found that MPOP extracts proteins at least as efficiently as urea lysis. And this extraction is uniformly efficient across different cellular compartments, such as the cytosol, the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the cell membrane. We have used MPOP for a number of different projects in our group and we continue to use it. It can be fully automated and it's relatively high throughput. And a number of colleagues have adopted it, including the lab of Roman Zubarev, Akus Begvari, and Erwin Skouf. And while MPOP provides one solution, we have been interested in further increasing the throughput and reliability of sample preparation while reducing the volumes. And in particular, we wanted to be able to process many hundreds or even thousands of single cells in parallel so that we can reduce batch effects and we can increase the throughput of sample preparation. We were interested in reducing the volume of sample preparation so that we can reduce contamination of various chemicals that are added during the sample preparation and also potentially increase, uh, decrease losses of proteins and peptides in the course of sample preparation. And we're, we were interested in having a very flexible experimental design. To achieve those aims, Andrew Leduc, a doctoral student in my group, came up with this open design shown schematically at the bottom of the slide, where Sample preparation is performed in tiny nanoliter sized droplets on the surface of a fluorocarbon coated glass slide. The arrangement of, of these droplets can be uh, arbitrary. It is very, very flexible. And in particular, we use an arrangement uh, in groups of 13 droplets because 13 is the number of single cells that we can label with TMT as part of our scope to design using isobaric carriers. In addition to droplets used for lysing and preparing individual cells for analysis, we also deposit a perimeter of water droplets to control the local humidity because as you can imagine, having these tiny droplets on open surface 
can result in losses unless we control the humidity very carefully. Uh, so the method is outlined with a schematic uh, shown here at the top of the slide, where we start by depositing DMSO and then single cells are deposited one cell at a time into these droplets of DMSO to be lysed, then digested by trypsin and further prepared in a fully automated fashion to peptides labeled with TMT quenched with hydroxylamine and pulled into uh, into sets for mass spec analysis. Uh, all these procedures are being performed inside of the cell in one instrument without the glass slides ever being moved. And this allows us to address each droplet with very high precision repeatedly. Uh, while this might, this, this fairly non-conventional flexible experimental design posed a number of challenges which were creatively solved by Andrew Leduc, shown here to, to the left, as he rose time and again to uh, coming up with very creative solutions to difficulties that we encountered on the way of preparing this method. Now, it, while this method allows us to use very small volumes uh, down to a few nanoliters to prepare samples from single cells, uh, we, it's not immediately clear that it's going to work. So Andrew did a number of controlled experiments to evaluate that. And first we wanted to evaluate whether the lysis with DMSO would be as efficient as lysis with well-established methods such as urea. So Andrew used an experimental design similar to the one employed by Harrison Speck earlier. And he found that DMSO is able to extract proteins from the different cellular compartments very efficiently. And the relative protein levels estimated from samples lysed with DMSO are highly correlated, highly similar to the corresponding relative protein levels estimated from samples prepared with urea. So one very important aspect of the sample preparation is uh, of single cells of, of tiny samples is making sure that the samples are not contaminated. And to control for contamination, we always include in our experiments a negative controlled droplet, uh, negative controlled droplets, many of those, which are essentially droplets that are deposited and that receive all of the chemicals and all of the treatment that all the other droplets accept that they don't receive a single cell. And we include those droplets so that we can see what is the level of contamination introduced by the various reagents that we use uh, at all stages of the sample preparation. And as you can see here, based on the report Ryan signal from both single cells and control wells, we see uh, reporter ions for the vast majority of peptides in single cells, both HeLa and Q937, with slightly higher abundance of the reporter ions from HeLa cells, which corresponds to the larger size of HeLa cells compared to U937 cells. But most of the reporter ions from uh, the negative control wells are zero. Their signal is completely absent, or if detected, it's very low which indicates that NPOP is able to keep the background contamination very low. As a low bar validation of the method, we performed principal component analysis of a few hundred HeLa and Q937 cells. And as you can see here, the cells are, are separated based on cell type by the first principal component, which accounts for the vast majority of variants in our data set. More interestingly, we are also able to perform principal component analysis uh, using proteins that are periodic with the cell division cycle to identify the cell cycle phase of each cell. And we are able to perform this analysis jointly for the HeLa and for the U937 cells, as, as indicated here. Furthermore, we were interested to explore what are the biological functions that co-vary with the cell division cycle and what are the proteins that are more abundant in one phase of the cycle versus another phase. To this end, we computed the correlations of cell cycle marker proteins 
and all other proteins quantified in our data set. And then we looked at the distribution of these correlations for functionally related groups of proteins. For example, here we explore the correlations of proteins from the large ribosomal subunit to markers for G1 phase, for S phase, and for G2 phase in killer cells and similarly in U937 cells. And what we find is that uh, ribosomal proteins are more highly correlated to G1 phase markers, indicating that ribosomal proteins are more abundant in G1 phase, which is consistent with the known biology that protein synthesis and cell growth occur to a very large extent in G1 phase. And what is particularly reassuring and convincing in this case is that in addition to this particular uh, set of proteins, we find many other functionally related groups of proteins related to translations such as RNA processing uh, and, 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 and ATP, ATP activity that are also consistent with this theme of protein synthesis occurring in G1 phase in both cell types. Similarly, there are other functions, uh, biological functions that are primarily correlated with G2 phase markers uh, in, in a way similar for the two cell types. We also performed this kind of analysis for uh, protein, for groups of proteins that differ in their covariation between the two cell types. And we find, uh, when we indeed found such groups such as some um, immune related functions, uh, which is to some extent expected considering that U937 cells uh, are immune, have immune functions not shared by killer cells. So with this, I'd like to acknowledge that everything that I shared with you has been the product of a very fun collaborative group and particularly, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the, the leading role of Andrew LeDuc in developing NPOP and generating all of the data that uh, I showed you on the cell division cycle, as well as the rest of uh, the students and, and the team that, that helped and made this project uh, possible. I would like to particularly acknowledge the generous support of the NIH Director's Award and the Allen Frontiers group that uh, supported this work with an Allen Distinguished Investigator Award.